read this? You haven't read it yet since you started off. Not yet. Okay, so basically, this all. Oh, I'm I'm not. I don't need an introduction. Oh no, that's fine. I'll yeah. just be here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this all started when I was a teenager growing up in London, and there was a really famous photographer in London called Lord Litchfield, Patrick Litchfield, and he was the, a cousin of the Queen, very tall, handsome man who was a society photographer. And I stumbled upon a, photog a photograph when I was very young of this unbelievably beautiful woman who was in, a, in an embroidered caftan lounging on a rooftop in some exotic country with palm trees behind her in a mosque. And, and, and there was also a man standing behind her in a hooded robe so you couldn't really see him properly. And there was just something about that photograph that I found completely compelling. And... I, I have always wanted to know who she was and what her story was. And over the years, I discovered that her name was Talita Getty. And excuse me, she was a Dutch socialite and, and at, wannabe actress who ended up falling in love with and marrying the son of, at the time, the richest man in the world, Paul Getty, the oil baron. And she married Paul Getty Jr., um, his son. And they had this extraordinary life where they had a wonderful house in Chelsea. They had a, a palatial apartment in Rome. And then on their honeymoon, they went to Marrakesh and they were meeting a friend of theirs called Bill Willis, who was this incredible designer who was originally from Memphis, Tennessee, but he had been living in Rome and had just moved to Marrakesh. And he was the one that said to them, come to Marrakesh, I'll be your guide, I'll, I'll show you everything. So they went to meet Bill in Marrakesh on their honeymoon. And by the end of that first day, he'd taken them to see this dilapidated palace called Le Palais de la Zahia. And they fell madly enough and they bought it. And they said to Bill, will you renovate it for us? And they left him in charge of the palace for a year. I didn't know all of this at the time. And, you know, and, and as I have gone through my life, I've always looked for photographs of her because there was there's something about her style, her beauty, the way she put things together. And I couldn't find anything out about her other than she died at the, she was married at the age of 25 and she died at the age of 30 of a heroin overdose. And there's been almost nothing written about her. And I was completely fascinated. And I just thought, I need to find out what her story is. Um, and in fact, I signed this new deal with HarperCollins and it was supposed to be for a sequel for The Beach House. And then out of nowhere, my new editor suddenly said, Jane, have you ever thought about doing historical fiction? And I immediately thought of the World War II books that all my friends write. And, but then I, I thought, well, I, I don't want to do that. And, and I said, do the 60s count? And because he's 12 years old, he said, yes. So I told him the story of what I knew of Talita Getty and that she had this kind of magnificent palace in Marrakesh and the Rolling Stones were there all the time and, and the Beatles were there and anyone who was anyone would stop up and say, look, I can see that you're passionate about this, so you, you need to write this. And it, so I had permission, but it was my first historical fiction, which was pretty daunting because I never had to do that kind of research before. So it took me almost a year, also because there was so little written about her. And I ended up making lists and lists of anyone who was ever photographed with her or who was in her social circle and then leaving everything I could, I sort of came at it sideways. And every now and then I'd stumble upon a paragraph or a page or in some instances, a few pages about Talita Getty. And it was like finding the diamond in the haystack. It was just so, I, I was so overwhelmed with joy every time I found one of these nuggets. And slowly, slowly I started really understanding who she was and, and what happened with her life and in fact one of the things I hadn't known about her was that she was actually born in the Dutch East Indies on the island of Java and her father was a painter they were from from Holland and he'd gone over to uh, Indonesia on a painting trip but the Japanese invaded 
and they immediately rounded up all of the Dutch who had colonized the islands mm -hmm. and threw them into um, internment camps. And the camps were brutal. So she spent her formative years in these Japanese prison camps where people would be killed on sight. There was torture as a child. She, the children, would the guards would stick their fingers in the children's eyes. And, you know, all these, these sort of terrible things, which I think left her with this extraordinary trauma mm. um, that she, you know, back in the 60s, she didn't know how to deal with. And... And I think so often about the number of people we lost in that time frame to drugs and alcohol, mm -hmm. Janice Joplin, um, Jimi Hendrix, Jim Morrison, I mean, the, the list goes on and on. And I always wonder whether they were using kind of drugs and alcohol to self-medicate in a way because we didn't have the options that are available to us now. We didn't have antidepressants, we didn't have therapists, you know, on every main street. We we it was very different. Um, but Talita grew into this extraordinary beauty and at a dinner party was sat next to Paul Getty who fell madly in love with her. And in the beginning, their life was like something out of a fairy tale. It truly was Arabian Nights because they threw the doors open of the palace in, in Marrakesh on New Year's Eve, 1967. And Talita very quickly renamed it the Palais des Plaisirs, the Pleasure Palace. And of course, this was the 60s where everything was happening. We had a sexual revolution. The pill was introduced in 1963. So suddenly you could have sex without worrying about getting pregnant. So we had this sexual revolution. We had um, a, a, a professor, a Harvard professor doing experiments and research into psychedelic drugs, Dr. Timothy Leary. Um, who came up with tune in, turn on, drop out. Um, so psychedelic drugs suddenly were everywhere and people hadn't experienced that. Um, and a number of things were going on and people, there was the counterculture. And in America, you had the hippies and hate Ashbury and Woodstock, the summer of love. In England, we had different influences. We had the, the North African and the Asian influences. Um, and so any everybody would, was doing the the North African hippie trail. And if they were slightly in the public eye or, or a member of the aristocracy, because everybody suddenly go mingled, they would stop off at the Getty Palace. Um, and as soon as they got there, they'd be taken onto the roof. They have this wonderful roof terrace that overlooks the whole of Marrakesh. And just in the in very close is the Ketubia, which is the mosque. And people were, there were floor pillows on the roof terrace and people would lounge on the floor pillow and they were served something which is an ancient Berber sweetmeat called majoun. And majoun is like a, it's like a fudge, like a truffle fudge made of a very finely chopped eggs, figs, cocoa powder, um, cardamom, cinnamon, rose water, orange blossom and hashish. And so it had, it was filled with marijuana, but the guests would, wouldn't, and they just have like a bite here and mint tea and, and, and a bite there. And, oh, it's delicious, just one more. And all of a sudden everybody was off their faces, which is what was happening. Um, and Vogue kept writing about her as, you know, Mrs. Getty strolls the soups in the morning looking for entertainers to amuse her guests. And she would, she'd go to the square, Jamal El Fla, and find snake charmers and acrobats and magicians and bring them back to the house to, to amuse the guests over dinner. And they, they had these dinners of like 30 people, 50 people. The palace is enormous and it has nooks and crannies everywhere. It's actually a series of riads put together. So there are, when they had it, there were three courtyards and a, like a gardens and a pool. I think now there are four or five. Um, and it looked impossibly glamorous. She was this great beauty. Her husband was handsome. They had the, the most idyllic looking life. But of course, what we didn't see is behind closed doors, everything was going wrong and it was out of control. He had developed an opium addiction. They traveled to um, Asia and he discovered opium and was actually growing. He planted fields of poppies 
house and sitting alone, mm -hmm. and and he was struggling with opium addiction, which very quickly became heroin addiction, mm -hmm. and she was struggling with her own demons. She did take opium and heroin with him, but it wasn't really. She she was more of a drinker. Actually, could polish off a bottle of vodka and be absolutely fine. Um, but I think her drug of choice was really people. And I think the way that she tried to escape her pain was by constantly surrounding herself with people and parties, people and parties. She was described by everybody who knew her as an enchantress. She was filled with life and, and joie de vivre and incredibly vivacious, and always laughing, always sunny. But when the doors were closed, she couldn't bear to be alone. She really struggled when she was on her own. And in fact, Paul Getty, who was raised by a mother who was not unlike Talita, I think saw a lot of, was drawn to her because she was so like his mother, but ultimately he actually was tremendously introverted. And he ended up, he couldn't stand the people all the time, that the house was constantly filled with waifs and strays and stragglers and people showing up and everybody was always welcome. And he stopped showing up. So they'd have these lavish dinners and picnics and, and he would maybe appear for a little while, but then he'd drift back off to his room in the palace where he would um, listen to opera and, and read about art and bookbinding was one of his passions. And so they really became, they started becoming more and more distanced. And they always had other lovers, which was very normal at that time. And he ended up um, getting very close to one of his mistresses. And in 1968, she had a baby who they named Tara Gabriel Gramophone Galaxy Getty, because it was the 60s. Now he just goes by Tara Getty. Um, but it just fell apart after that. And she ended up moving to London. He ended up moving to Rome with his mistress. And I think there was still tremendous love for each other, but they they were a terrible fit and they were not good together. And she knew that. She said that to friends. She knew she loved him, but she knew she had to leave. And in 1971, she was she was 30 years old, turning, she would have turned 31. She flew back to Rome with divorce papers to serve him. Something happened, none of us really know. Um, the story that, that feels the truest to me, knowing what I know about her, is that she wasn't, she was clean, um, and she tried to seduce him back, and he rejected her, and she went into a, a bedroom and took a huge heroin overdose. Mm -hmm. And there were people in, you know, he was deep in his own addiction. There were people in and out of the apartment all night, he kept checking on her and he thought she was sleeping when in fact she was she was dying and by the time they realized it was too late and he then plummeted into a terrible depression he became a recluse for years um ended up living you know a full life and and finding he ended up with the woman who was his mistress actually who is still around today but i, I think at the time, Italy had a mandatory prison sentence of 10 years for possession of heroin. So he left Rome that had been his home for years and he never went back. And he also never set foot. He, he lived in the, the London house, but he didn't go back to the house in Marrakesh. And he sold it to the French actor Alain Delon, who lived there for 17 years. And then in, I think it was the late 80s, um, the late 80s or the 90s, Alain Delon had a friend who's this hugely famous writer and philosopher in France called Bernard Henri Levy. And Bernard Henri Levy had just made his first film and it was a disaster and it, it was received terribly. And all of the people who kind of hated Bernard Henri Levy just used it as an advantage to kill him in the press. And Alain Delon phoned him and said, hey, you need to get away from everything. Why don't you come stay at my house in Marrakesh? And and Bernard, but he's known in France as B as by his initials B H L, which in French is Bachel. So everybody, he's like the most famous man in France. Everybody knows him as as Bachel. 
So he showed up at the palace in Marrakesh and, and it was just him. And he walked through the gardens and he found Alain Delon. He said, I, I have to buy this house. And Alain Delon was like, okay. And he has owned it ever since. And they, he went back to Bill Willis, the designer who originally did the house for the Gettys. And he also had done the houses for Yves Saint Laurent. And they added onto the house and Bill Willis did the addition. Um, and they still had because none of the furniture had been removed. And Alain Delon had added some things which he took away, not even realizing that he was taking away the things that were never supposed to have been added in the first place. So the house is still very much as it was. And I had this extraordinary experience two weeks ago. I was in Marrakesh and through a friend of a friend, I, I got his contact details and I was invited for dinner to the palace. And uh, two and a half weeks ago, I, and I'd already been outside just to sort of pay, you know, pay yeah. my respect, like my little homage to, to Lita. So I'd seen the bougainvillea tumbling over the walls. I was like, oh, I'm not going to do anything, just, just, just see where she lived. And, and, and we showed up and what happens in Marrakesh, this is very much part of the Islamic um, culture is, is the religion of Islam frowns upon any displays of wealth, you know, you, know, you, you are not supposed to make people jealous by, by showing your wealth. And it, 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 modesty is, is, a, is a huge tenet of, of Islam. And so traditionally the people, people have built houses behind walls, high walls, so you see nothing. All you see is a little wooden door and you have no idea what's behind. It also allowed the women privacy to wash and be free without having to, to hide, hide themselves. Um, in front of men so you just get to this little wooden door and you open the door and you're in like a a passageway it's like a little tiled hallway and then a long passageway down and then suddenly you're in this this courtyard that has now been all of the plantings that they put in in 1966 remain and have now grown into like a tropical jungle mm. with like hanging vines and huge palms and ferns and and birds and cats everywhere and and the fame there's, there's a, another very famous picture of her sort of holding onto a fountain which is still there and there's so much furniture that's still there that I recognize from my hundreds of pictures that I've now put together anyway it was it was magical to see and feel where she lived. Um, and I thought that I had exercised my sort of obsession with Marrakesh, with Talita Getty, with the 60s by writing this book. I was like, I'm because so, I'm, I, I have a very obsessive nature. I'm like, write the book and then you can just get on with living your life. But no, it's yeah. got stronger. And so now I'm trying to move there. I'm working on getting my husband on board. And I think the perfection for me is April to November in Westport. And then, or maybe October, and then the winter in Marrakesh. So um, I'm still as obsessed as I always was. It's the, it's the book that I... Well, it's a very different book from my normal book, but it's a book that I'm absolutely passionate about. And there are many, not many, but some, I loved writing The Sunshine Sisters. I loved writing The Beach House. I loved writing Jemima J. I mean, there are certain books of mine that I, I have really loved writing and that they're very close to my heart. But this one is, is a love letter. And, and in so many ways, this has more of me than any of the others, because this is a love letter to the 60s which is I really I was born in the 60s but I feel like I should have come of age in the 60s although I might not have survived it um <laughs> it's my love letter to Marrakesh and it's my love letter to Talita so that is Sister Stardust and if anybody has any questions I'd love to answer them do you meet any of her family I haven't met any of her family um I, I know that her son knows about the book and somebody has given him a copy. He had said to, to somebody, um, apparently there's a book about my mother, but it, and it's very lovely. And I think, I think the thing is so often 
things are sensationalized. And I think the Getty family really shut down mm -hmm. because of the tragedy. Um, I spoke to a number of her friends. I was more astonished by how many people didn't want to talk. Mm -hmm. they, they just did not want to revisit that time period at all. Mm -hmm. But I managed to speak to a couple of her friends. Um, and one of them in particular, I, I actually have become quite close to, uh, and I really love this one. She lives in LA, so we haven't met, but you know we have had these, these three hour long phone calls. And I realized at some point I'd have to send her the book. And I was terrified because she was there. In fact, she was with them the day they first saw the palace. She was a photographer taking all the photographs of them. And I sent her the book, terrified, because what if I got it all wrong? And she called me up a few days later and she said, well, I've read, I've read the book and you got one thing wrong. And I thought, oh, and, and, and she said, well, there's a scene where Talita arrives in because uh, uh, the book isn't about Talita. This is the this is the bit. Uh, it's it's about a girl who grows up outside of London, just as London is exploding into colour and becoming you know the centre of the swinging sixties. And all this girl wants to do is move to London. She eventually gets there, and she gets swept up in this glamorous crowd of kind of pop rock stars and musicians. And on a whim, one night they say, hey, let's all go to Marrakesh and stay with Talita and Paul Getty. And, you know, which is what people would do in those days. And also Europe, it's very, you know, you, you'll hop on the ferry to France, drive through, or even the plane. It's just, it's very easy to get anywhere. Um, and so she shows up to the palace in Marrakesh. So this isn't really Talita's story. I didn't feel like I knew her well enough to tell her story from her perspective, mm. but it's the story of, of a girl who gets caught up in in her world, it is Talisha's story, but it's also it's also a coming of age story. It's about Claire and who becomes Cece, um, and it's her coming of age story, and uh, and it's also a book about female friendship and those kinds of very intense female friendships that many of us have experienced where it almost feels like you've met a soulmate, you meet somebody, you're like, oh my God, this could be like my sister. I and how they always they burn so brightly that they end up burning out if they're they're impossible to sustain. Um, so there are a number of things, but so I wrote this story from Claire's perspective. But when this photographer phoned me up after she'd read it and she was there, she said, the scene where Claire first arrives in Marrakesh, she has nothing to wear. And suddenly there's a knock on her bedroom door and there at the door is a houseboy with his arms filled with Talita's clothes to lend to her. And my friend said Talita would never have lent her clothes. She was far too self-centered, <laughs> which I thought was very funny because in my, I'd romanticized her so much that, you know, there wasn't a hint of anything negative in her personality. Although, of course, looking back, she was 25. Of course she was self-centered. Who isn't at 25? Um, but then my friend said, something that still gives me goosebumps she said Jane I've read so many books over the years that talk about the 60s and the sex and the drugs and the rock and roll and all of them have sensationalized it your book is the first one I've read that captured how it felt it, you capture how it felt to be there and that is still I think the greatest compliment I've ever had um yeah. So I so I know that Tara has got the book. I, I imagine he's read it. I haven't heard from him. I have no interest in talking to the other Gettys. They were I, my interest was was really was it was the combination. It was the 60s Marrakesh and Talita. Mm -hmm. I, I'm I'm not interested in, in the rest of the Gettys really. Um there was just the, the three of my passions happened to converge. I can see the picture yeah. <laughs> that inspired. <laughs> if you Google Talita Getty, it's going to be one of the first ones that come up. And you'll see. The funny thing is, I'd always thought there was a look in her eyes of sadness. Mm. But in fact, I discovered that she was so stern during that photo shoot that Vogue almost didn't run the pictures. Because, um, there, you know, there was a lot of, of pleasures going on in the palace.
but there's also a price to pay for that kind of sybaritic lifestyle you know there are very few people who can live that way and, and not find that there is a price to pay mm -hmm. we were talking earlier about how writing is sort of how you come to understand the world yeah. uh was there do you have a sense of what it was that you were trying to understand on the other side of this book now do you have a sense of what you were maybe trying to suss out through yeah such a great question Kristen <laughs> I've never been asked that but I think I was trying to understand me mm -hmm. and and how I I when I turned 50 and and I actually I hadn't been to Marrakesh at that point but I threw a Marrakesh themed like hippie chic you know Marrakesh 60s birthday party for myself <laughs> And I remember very clearly also thinking I was somebody who spent her whole life feeling like I didn't fit in. I did from from as, as far back as I can remember as a child. I wasn't I wasn't clever enough. I wasn't thin enough. I wasn't pretty enough. I, I just wasn't enough. I felt like my whole life felt like it wasn't enough. And even even when I had these bestsellers and, you know, I had this amazing career, I still always felt like I was. I, I, people wouldn't really it was sort of imposter syndrome I just got lucky and also because I felt like I didn't fit in I, was tr I tried so hard to fit in so I was a real chameleon I was constantly changing my I'd have to sort of make sure that I had the right clothes and the right bag and the right hairstyle and the right everything and mm -hmm. at 50 I just thought who the fuck are you I mean it's exhausting like what if you just stop trying to be stop trying on these other roles and figured out who actually are you and and I feel like I couldn't have my journey was tied up with Talita somehow and there was something about the freedom of those times and the way that they lived that that somehow allowed me to kind of to accept that it that actually I don't want to look like everybody else. In fact, I've kind of gone back to embracing my art school roots. You know, in fact, I hate looking like everybody else. I I don't want to. Um, and you know what? I you will never find me in athleisure wear. I will Lululemon and I will never <laughs> never meet. And in fact, I find that I love caftans and I love I love just being more of a free spirit. I love being able to decide. Hey, you know what? I'm going to go to Morocco next week and going and and actually kind of seizing life and and really weeding out the things that don't make me happy and having much more of the things that do whether that's people or how I like to and 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 really really letting go of worrying about what people think of me and I that journey is tied up in the writing of this book and the, the freedom in this book is very much, yeah, the journey that, that I went on and kind of find myself today just in a place where it's not that I don't have the same worries, struggles, fears as anybody else. I just, I choose happiness. So that's a very convoluted answer. No, that was a lovely. <laughs> it really helps me understand, I think, both cc and Talita's yeah. character on a much deeper level so thank yeah. you <laughs> thank you have you heard anything about the mistress you know if she took any interest in your book or has said anything about that time period no, i and her name is victoria she lives there she married him she and paul getty married and, and it seems like they had um you know a really wonderful life together she is still alive he is not oh. Uh, she is in London. I don't know. I'm almost scared to contact them, and and yet, I mean, I should. I mean, I'm going to be in London in May and June, and I, I, I don't know how I'd be received. You know, it's very families that are as wealthy and influential as the Gettys tend to be very private, very insular. They don't like having anything written about them. Um, I know the Getty family were very vocal about it, really disliking the TV shows that were made about the kidnapping. So remember the, yeah, the boy yeah, that was yeah. kidnapped? Paul Getty, Talisha's husband, was his father. 
Okay. So the, the boy that was kidnapped and had his ear cut off okay. was one of his kids from his first marriage. He had okay. four children from their first marriage. But these families are, you know, my, my husband is from one of these families. But as I have to say, darling, he's old money just without money. <laughs> um, sadly, the money has all disappeared. But he's from one of these kind of illustrious, well-known families. And, and I know how private and odd they are. And any outsider writing about them is, is, is not welcomed. Mm. So even though this is very much, and I was very cognizant during the whole writing of it that this there are people alive who knew her, who loved her, and I, I wanted this to be respectful and loving, and I, I think I have written something respectful and loving, and I also know how hard it is to, to for, for people in that family to perhaps to, to read it. So. Well, I, I, if anyone would like a book signed, I had a pen, I'm sure it's there somewhere. <laughs> oh, I, I didn't steal it along with your cookie. <laughs> <laughs> How did you start writing? Where, like, what is your background for schooling? And like, um, I actually went to I went to art school. Well, I went to university to do fine art. Dropped out. Went to art school. Dropped out. I'm a total dropout. I never went back and got the degree. Fell into journalism. Was a journalist for years in my twenties. Loved the writing part. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was the bit. But the getting of the story, I didn't care so much. I loved. I would just be able to lose myself in writing. And I think I became a writer because I was a reader. Because I was that child who didn't fit in, the place where I found my solace and my joy was always in the pages of books. Mm -hmm. So I was a huge reader. Um, but I fell into journalism. And when I was 27, you know, I did really well. I mean, I was a feature writer mm -hmm. on the women's desk of a national newspaper. And, um, and then a friend of mine suddenly decided to write a book. And I thought, oh, hang on, she can do it, I can do it. And I did. And that was the beginning. And here we are all these years later. Funnily enough, I still write for the, the paper I was writing for back in my 20s. I'm now there. I'm Dear Jane. I'm the, I'm the advice <laughs> columnist for the Daily Mail.com. I don't know if anybody reads the Daily Mail. It's the best online showbiz gossip ever. <laughs> but, no, I do. I, I'm a big, uh, well, I'm shame to say I read too much about the royal family and things like that. Yeah, well then you, you yeah. <laughs> so every Sunday I, I have Dear okay. Jane, okay. the Dear Jane advice column where people write to me for advice <laughs> and I do my best to be a wise, warm, compassionate voice and give them good advice. Comments are brutal, but you know what? They don't even bother me anymore, actually. I, I'm beginning to find them quite funny, even when they're cruel, because it's okay. It is very interesting how they just have no shame well, in writing what they write. It's hilarious. I think people also don't realize they think that if you're, if you have any kind of a public profile, whether it's from writing a book or being an actor, or I think they think you don't read it. I think they think that they're, that therefore it's they can be as as cruel and nasty they I think maybe they think it's funny but they can they can disparage people and they I think they because who would ever say that to someone's face maybe you, can't, you know you would never go up to someone's face and say something really cruel about them you, you just wouldn't do it so it's I really despair a lot about how the world has changed it is interesting yeah. I had a professor in college who he wrote a book it wasn't the most exciting book but he was very passionate about yeah. it so you would talk about it all the time we we did an assignment on it and he came in one day with like a sign and we're like oh what's the sign and it was one of the harsher um, reviews from his book and he hung it on the wall he goes this is going to motivate me for my next one and he just hung it there but he was so proud of it he goes see everybody read it <laughs> when you guys don't when you guys don't really like my book just know you're not the only one. So he held it there as like a motivation, but he what? was able to turn it around. Um, I'm not sure if he ever went back to writing, but he did go back to, um, he went back to like mentoring, uh, sponsored people for PhDs. Like he went through and he did that, but it, that didn't, I'm sure he felt that sting initially, but he didn't let that like get him down. But yeah. I just thought it was so funny how he just showed up with it one day. He just put it right there on the wall. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, look, everybody's different. I I definitely, for me, it's almost been, I've had to read the comments to numb myself, to get to a place where I'm actually numb to it and realizing these people are actually, or 
I remember somebody saying to me years ago, never take advice from someone from whom you wouldn't take criticism, or never take criticism from somebody from whom you wouldn't take advice. I'm like, I'm not going to any of these people. Like, it, it means nothing. Um, so, and it's my favorite gig right now. I love it. I love having a weekly column. Love it beyond anything. I think, I mean, that's the kind of writing that I'd love to do more of. Um, a weekly and I had a weekly column in a, in an English magazine the lady for a few years which I also love just little snippets of, of life in a column I really enjoy 